Lacey Hoover and welcome to Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. This video is brought to you by the Biofuels Graduate Course in the Appropriate Technology Department. If you have any questions or want to know more information, please email us at appstategci at gmail.com. Hi, so this is our, our steampunk pyrolysis uh, bioreactor is what we like to call it. Um, I'll sort of explain the system to you. So we take biomass, in this case pieces of wood, you can also use um, really anything that's organic and dry. All you mushers up in Alaska can take your dried dog poop and stick it in there. And then you heat it up in the absence of air. So this bolts down and there's essentially no oxygen in there. Um, to heat this up, what we're doing is actually using a propane tank um, and just heating it from underneath. You can also obviously use the biomass itself to heat the reaction. So you could burn some wood under the wood that you're heating up. This is just for demonstration purposes. Basically, you're volatizing everything in the biomass that's not the carbon that ultimately becomes the biochar. So a little bit of carbon remains, and that's sort of your pure biochar charcoal that stays behind. Everything else gets turned into a gas, comes through here. This is a cyclone filter. So the air swirls around, the particles theoretically drop out. Also, we find that some of our tar gets condensed here and falls out. This whole pipe acts as a condenser, so we're losing heat along the way. Then we come here to the car radiator. Um, this is for heat exchange. Obviously, this process produces a lot of heat, so that's one of the products of it is that you can heat a house or a greenhouse or any number of things. And we're condensing out here water, we're condensing out tar, um, and we're left just with syngas, which is a combination of a couple gases. Our syngas comes through here and ultimately comes out here. If this gas is clean enough, you can actually stick this directly into an engine um, and run it on that. In fact, during the World War II, when we were short on oil, um, you know, it was all being mobilized for the war effort, they actually built cars that ran on a bioreactor. So sort of this whole thing hooked up to the back of a car. As always, safety comes first. So we hang a streamer so that we know which way the wind is flowing so we can avoid the products of combustion. Now it is safe to begin the reaction and light our reactor. After 10 minutes, we have clean fuel gases of carbon monoxide, hydrogen, methane, and some carbon dioxide. So we have collected a bag of gas, and after 30 minutes, we have also collected creosote. And now for fun, we're going to blow up our fuel bag. Now we are doing fractional distillation and we are going to collect our creosote from one location and then compare it to the creosote in the other. This location is the hot creosote. See how thick it is? Dear viewers, if you have any idea what this pink is, please send us an email, because we don't. Our first creosote was about at 600 degrees. Our cooler creosote from the radiator is about at boiling temperature. Hey, check it out. That's more like gasoline. That's more like gasoline. Look at that. I thought it was like water. Me too. Yeah. Wow. After the reaction, what we're taking out is biochar. My name is Jacob. I'm going to be talking about biochar. It's the uh, sort of first revenue stream that comes out of this pyro pyrolysis system. Um, it's based on the concept of Ted or Preta, which is a really ancient concept uh, started by 
the natives of the Amazon region of Brazil thousands of years ago. And it's very similar to commercial hardwood charcoal. Um, it's just more fully volatilized. So there's not much left other than the carbon compounds. Here's some of it right here. The big difference from charcoal is that it doesn't really have a smoky smell. Um, you can't sm smell it obviously, but it doesn't really smell much like smoke. Um, it doesn't really leave much of a residue either. If you if you break it apart, it's, it's very fine, and then you can just kind of brush it off your hands, and your hands come off mostly clean. Um, it's just a very highly porous structure where microorganisms can take place, and these things are beneficial to, to all sorts of plant life. Um, they keep water and nutrients from being washed away, from leaching away into the soil. There's maybe a couple different dozen uses for biochar, but the one we're most interested in here is, is the use in gardening and farming. Hi, I'm David Dahmermuth, and I'm the principal investigator for this project. This project is being funded by the EPA. It's a P3, that's People, Planet, and Prosperity grant that students won for Appalachian State. We heat up the vessel and we make the smoke, and then the smoke is condensed right here, and it has a couple of names. Uh, the names on the that I'm talking about, it's often called pyrolysis oil or pie oil. The new term is biocrude. And uh, it's, it's always been historically known as, uh, as um, creosote. So it's a smelly black liquid. It essentially has the same use and value as number two fuel oil. Ultimately, of course, we want the fuel gases. So we're heating up the biomass. We're separating or filtering out the crude so that we don't have that tar going into the engine. So, for future plans, we hope to scale up, connect it to a generator, and hopefully heat a greenhouse. If you want to know more information, or if you have more information, please email us at appstategci at gmail.com.